Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for Holy Thursday here at the Long Neck Methodist Church. A couple of announcements as we begin tonight, <clears throat> just so that we all understand how the evening will progress. Um, the lights are down this evening for a reason. This is a, this is a, a, a service of light and dark. Um, it, is a, it is intended to be a somber service and is one in which you'll find more darkness than light. Um, during the service, at the end of the service, when we do the service of Tenebrae, all of the house lights will be turned off. You won't have to move around or do anything during the service of Tenebrae, so you won't have to worry about that, but the lights will be turned down and it will be dark in here with the exception of those who are going to be reading for us. At the conclusion of the service of Tenebrae, the lights will be brought back up again. We'll have a closing hymn, and then we will do as is traditional and as is theological, we will strip the church here on Thursday evening, and it will remain that way until Sunday morning. The manner in which we strip the church is as follows. At the end of the service of Tenebrae, the 15 readers will come forward, and everything that we see here in the church will basically be taken out of the church. It'll be taken back out of the sanctuary itself and stored back in either the nursery or in the prayer room uh, to be brought back out in time for Sunday's services. After the 15 readers have completed their time and if they've taken those back, what we'll simply ask you to do is if you wish to participate in the stripping of the church, you simply form two lines down either side, stand together, and we will pass those items down so that you may pass them from one person to the next, so that each person will participate in touching or passing on those items which will be left as we move and we strip the church. Finally, the thing which is probably the most difficult for all of us is you will see at the end of our service this evening that we are to dismiss in silence. When the service is over and the dismissal is given, you are asked, given the magnitude of the evening that we are here for, that you simply leave the service in silence. It is difficult, I know. It is unnatural, I know. We want to talk, we want to spend time with one another, um, but in keeping with the spirit of the reason we are here this evening, we will not be talking and we will not be laughing, carrying on, and departing from the spirit and the intensity and the reason which brings us here this evening. So, that said, I would ask you to join us. Miss Leslie is going to lead us in our call to worship. We have traveled far and our souls are dusty. Jesus kneels before us and washes our feet. How are we worthy of such love? Jesus humbles himself as a servant. How can this be? Jesus fills us with his love. What can we do? Serve our neighbors with God's love. Please join with me in the opening prayer. God of mystery, we gather tonight to remember the story which leads us into new life. As Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, may we learn to serve one another. As we gather at the table, may we be ready for the journey ahead. Remind us, O oh God, to love one another, even when doing so is difficult even when we want to lash out in anger, even when we want to ignore those who need us. We are not in charge. We are called to serve, to share your love. Be with us, O oh God, as we begin the journey that leads to the cross. Amen. You may be seated. Today's first reading comes from Psalm 116, 1 through 4, and 12 through 19. It's a thanksgiving for deliverance from death. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death surrounded me. And the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I implore, you deliver my soul. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord. Now in the presence of all his people, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly, I am your servant. 
I am your servant, the son of your maid servant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Our opening hymn is page 292, What Wondrous Love This Is. We cry to you, O God, save me, O God, from selfish ways, from my fears, from my reluctance to forgive, from my worries and my concerns, from my empty promises. Save me from all keeps from loving others. Lord, save my life. Amen. Our second reading this evening comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 
through 26. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. The word of God for the people of God. Our prayer, our words of assurance this evening. God hears our cries and our supplications. We are precious in God's sight. We are saved by God's abundant love and mercy. Our prayer hymn this evening, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, page 703 in your hymnal.
Brothers and sisters, you may be seated. And as our ushers come forward to receive our tithes and our offerings on this most holy night, let us pray. Almighty God, for the day that you have given us and the time that you have shared with us this evening, we thank you for calling us forth, for calling us out, for calling us to this place, this most holy of holies. As we stand on hallowed ground, tonight we come to be in your presence. We pray, Lord, that all that we are, all that we have, and all that we give will be worthy in your sight that it may be used to extend your kingdom here and hereafter. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Church, please rise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Amen. Church, you may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Our third reading this evening comes from the Gospel of John. John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, and then 31 through 35. Either follow along in your own Bibles or hear these words now. In the Gospel of John, chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And the supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, and Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from the supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. (coughs) After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Then Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are all not clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. In chapter 13, verse 31. 
Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I have said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Sisters and brothers, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We gather tonight on Monday, Thursday, and for many, Monday, Thursday is one of the most sacred days, one of the most sacred services of our church year. It is sacred because of two events that are associated with Holy or Monday Thursday. Holy Communion, the institution of communion, and Jesus' foot washing of the disciples. It is sacred because tonight begins what's known as the Tritium. It is the three holy days between sundown this evening and the Passion of Christ, concluding at sundown on Easter. It is sacred because tonight... We gather together at the table to remember the one who we, like the disciples in the Gospel of John, have dearly loved and have lost. In the washing of the disciples' feet, Jesus says to them and to us to follow his example. We, as the faithful today, are called to take our towels and bathe the wounds of the world in the name of Christ. In the foot washing, we see Peter's objection. Peter at first objected to having his feet washed by Jesus at all until Jesus said to him, unless I wash your feet, you shall have no part with me. And when he heard those words, all of a sudden, Peter wanted Christ to wash every inch of him. In many ways, we are just like those original 12 as we gather here tonight. We may be in desperate need of our own washing, our own foot washing. We need that wash to renew our strength and our compassion and our spirit to continue in the ministry to which God has given us, the calling that we have spoken of for all these many weeks. And if we, like Peter, refuse the washing of our feet by Jesus, we may find ourselves cut off, cut off from the very source of power that we need so desperately to continue to survive in this world. And in a bit, as we gather at the Lord's table for the meal, we might find that we have difficulty forgiving ourselves or accepting the grace of God that is offered to all of us. But I ask you to think about all of those that were gathered at the table with Christ that night. Think about each person that sat with him. Judas was there, and yet Christ knew that he was going to betray him. Peter was there, and Christ knew that Peter was going to deny him three times. James and John were there, and Jesus knew that they would not be able to stay awake in the garden and pray with him. And all the rest of the disciples were there, and Jesus knew full well that each and every one of them, all 12 of them, would depart and forsake him in his deepest, darkest hour, his greatest hour of need. He knew they would leave him. And so you ask yourself, how did he react to the band of disciples the people that he knew had been chosen for him by God, who had walked with him and eaten with him and seen miracles performed by him, how did he react when each one, usually more than once, would disappoint Jesus in their actions, in their words, in their deeds, or what they did not do or did not say? As you read the passages surrounding this evening, you find that Jesus did not scold them. He did not correct them at the, at the Lord's table at the Last Supper. He didn't punish anyone. What did he do to the ones who disappointed him so many times? He turned to each one of them and washed their feet. He washed their dirty, dirt-caked, smelly, crusty feet knowing full well that all 12 were destined to disappoint him in the days to come. He gently washed away the ugliness from each one of those disciples. And so in a moment, we're going to come to the communion table and to be reminded, to be reminded that this is a place where we may come time and time again to have our own 
ugliness touched and washed away by the love of Christ. We pray that you take many things away from the service tonight. One of the things we pray that you feel and experience and remember is the understanding that Jesus instructed the very first disciples as he instructs us in 2022. He said to them and he says to you as you sit here this evening, love each other as he loves us. The love of Christ is greater than anything and everything that seeks to separate us from Christ. Tonight we see that Jesus is fully aware of what is about to happen to him, but yet he remains in control. Events do not control him. He controls them. When he instituted the Last Supper with such great care, we understand here tonight and every time we celebrate at the Lord's table that whenever we participate, we proclaim two things. First, that Jesus Christ is the true Messiah. And secondly, that we join all in to follow Christ. The Last Supper reminds us of the first Passover. Passover starts tomorrow evening at sundown. The feasts coincide this year, one after the other. And that Passover feast, as you recall, remembers the saving grace of Yahweh, who had the sacrificial lamb to save those people prior to the Exodus. And with the Last Supper, we see that Christ is about to restore the kingdom of God because of His death and His sacrifice as the Lamb. We understand and we see that the death of Christ is not martyrdom for a cause, but Him atoning for our sins. He's not dying for some cause, as many of the disciples may have thought. He is dying for you and for me and for all before us and all after us for our sins. And he does that to bring us back into a relationship with God. For those of you that are familiar with the traditional Passover meal, it was and always is eaten by the family with the presumption that God is present in the room and in the home as the Passover is celebrated. And when God is there, it's not just any other ordinary meal. The disciples and the followers of Christ all the way down to today declare, confess, and proclaim that Jesus is Lord, the Messiah, the living God, and that when we share in the blood and the bread and the cup of Christ, it brings both joy and hardship. Tonight, Monday, Thursday, is more than just a trip down memory lane. It is a time to remind us of the allegiance and the commitment and the giving over of our presence to God. I remind you once again for perhaps one of the last times this season of the words we heard on Ash Wednesday, the words from the prophet Joel, to return to the Lord with all of your heart and to permit God to have control over all of your life. Have you ever been invited to a meal or a dinner party that you really didn't want to attend? Or maybe you were uncertain about what was going to happen when you showed up at the house. When you arrive, your host or your hostess does their very best to make you feel at ease and to make you feel at home and comfortable. To that host on that night, it really doesn't matter what your day was like or whether it was great or not so great before you crossed the threshold because when you got to that house, what mattered most is that you are there. Think again about all of those who were invited to the table of Christ on that final night. Judas and Peter and John and James and all of the other. They were all guests who would fail to acknowledge the host and even repudiate the host in the end. I started out by telling you that Monday Thursday is a very special service. It's one of my favorites. We remember Monday, and you'll look up Monday. It's really short for Mondatum, Mondatum Novum. Mondatum Novum reminds us of a new commandment. Christ washed the feet and gathered together at his table and he announced to the disciples that he had a new commandment for us. And the new commandment was very simple, to love one another as he loves us. Tonight as we gather here this evening, I ask you, can you love the betrayer in your life? 
Can you love the one who denies you repeatedly? Can you love the ones who sleep instead of stand and pray and watch with you? Can you love the ones who turn their backs and walk away when you need them the most? These are indeed difficult questions. That is exactly what Christ shares on this Monday, Thursday. Jesus loved the betrayer, and he loved the denier, and he loved the deserter, and he loved all of the traitors. He washed their feet, and he had a meal with them. Why? Because he loved them. We gather tonight in a place and in a time and in a world where we ask ourselves, would we do as Christ had done? We see tonight just how oblivious those 12 were to the things that were going to happen starting the very next morning. Jesus had full knowledge. The disciples could only be concerned with themselves. They were having this side conversation or side conversations with each other. I want to be first. Do you think I'll be first? I want to be closest. I want to be next in line. And then after the supper, as it progresses, they ask each other and they ask themselves, is it me? Will I be the one to betray Christ? With all of this going around in the minds of the disciples, Jesus still washed their feet and ate with them. All of them. Knowing full well that he would die the next day on the cross. For all of them. And for all of us. All of our heart. Not just pieces. The disciples were having a celebratory dinner. They had come in, if you remember the last Sunday, they had come into town for the palm celebration with a crowd shouting Hosanna with him on a colt leading into the city. The great Messiah had come, and all they could think about was the celebration for themselves, and yet Jesus knew that he was about to die a horrible death, and yet he still loved them. They had no idea what was coming. Jesus knew every detail, different perspectives on the same event to be sure, but it's the same result for all of us. Love your neighbors as you love yourself. We are at a time in our world when we are so divided we think that there's no turning back. We have divided among ourselves in so many different ways and so many different, so many different shades and types and varieties. It is easier for us to think how we're different and not figure out how we're alike. Heavens, we've even figured out a way to divide our religions and our denominations in the last couple of years. But tonight, we think about tonight. We think about Jesus giving his disciples that mandatum novum, that new covenant, the covenant to love. And he gives the mandate very shortly before his death. The very fact that Jesus spends his last meal with his friends, begging them to love one another in spite of all of their differences and their disagreements and their distinctions is quite compelling, isn't it? And as we gather here this evening, that is what Christ asked of all of us. Are you ready? Are you willing? Are you prepared? to love one another as Christ has loved us. This evening, we will celebrate at the Lord's table. We will celebrate as we always do, and we call the gathering at the Lord's table a celebration because we celebrate and commemorate this night, remembering that tonight is a night when only Christ knew what was to befall him. But we come, as the Jewish people do, with the tradition of Passover, remembering that God used the Passover lamb for his people Israel, and then Christ as the Lamb for all of us. So as we prepare to gather in the celebration of the sacrament of communion, I'd ask if you would join us, please. Rise if you're able in body or in spirit, and let us proclaim that which makes us who and what we are by reciting together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty.
Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, you may be seated as we gather together this evening to come and celebrate, to celebrate at this sacrifice, the sacrifice at the Lord's table. Join me, if you will. Our celebration for the holy Thursday evening is found in your bulletins. Please join as we say together that which causes us to come to the Lord's table this evening. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, the Creator of heaven and earth. From the earth you bring forth bread and create the fruit of the vine. You formed us in your image, delivered us from captivity, and made covenant to be our sovereign God. You fed us manna in the wilderness and gave grapes as evidence of the promised land. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When we had turned aside from your way and abused your gifts, you gave us in him your crowning gift, emptying himself that our joy might be full. Be fed, he fed the hungry healed the sick, ate with the scorned and forgotten, washed his disciples' feet, and gave a holy meal as a pledge of his abiding, abiding presence. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, Eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and grape. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As Jesus taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the body of Christ, broken for you, take, eat. The blood of Christ poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. As Christ has instructed, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, our table is now prepared. That's a couple of things for us to remember and to remind ourselves of. This is a period of self-examination, a time when we consider ourselves and when we think about our worthiness and our righteousness. No one else judges us. It is our coming to the Lord's table, not the man's table, but the Lord's table, to come in celebration and unity with Christ. If you wish to receive the gluten-free elements of the sacrament of communion, I will be on my left, your right tonight. Please come to that line. Because of the number of persons that are here this evening, we will celebrate with three lines. So, Tammy, I'm going to need two, if you have the opportunity, two additional stewards to come forth and assist. You may take the opportunity as you come forth. Please feel free to spend time at the communion rail if you wish to spend time in prayer. But spend this time remembering what we have heard, what we have experienced, and what we know. At the instruction of your ushers, please come forward as you were so advised.
Let us pray. On this most holy of nights, Father, we give you thanks for revealing to us the great mystery, the mystery of the body and the blood of Christ given to us each and every time we come to celebrate at your table. We thank you for the sacrifice of which, no, of which none of the disciples knew, the sacrifice which was about to occur, which would save them and us. We pray, Lord, that the gravity of this evening not be lost upon us, that this not be just another Thursday night before the celebrations of Sunday, that it be a time in which we examine ourselves, our lives, our beings, our comings and our goings, that we may be worthy in your sight. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Amen. At this time, we will begin the celebration of the service of Tenebrae. Our, our readers will come forth. You will hear the readings. And at the conclusion of the service, we will engage in the remainder of our readings. Jerry, I believe you are number one. Jesus went forth with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus had often, often met there with his disciples. So Judas, procuring a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word which he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me? the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Judea authorities seized Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the highest priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had given counsel to the righteous authorities that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. As this disciple was known to the high priest, he entered the court of the high priest along with Jesus, while Peter stood outside at the door. <coughs> so the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman who guarded the gate said to Peter, Are you also not one of these men's disciples? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself.
priests then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jewish people come together. I have said nothing secretly. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? And Ananias then sent him down to Caiaphas, the high priest, Simon Peter was standing and warning himself, warming himself. They said to him, Are not you also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a kinsman of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the cock, cr the, the cock crowed. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so that they might not be defiled but might eat the Passover. So Pilate went to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have handed him over. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The religious authorities said to him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. This was to fulfill the word which Jesus had spoken to show by what death he was to die. Pilate entered the headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight, that I might not be handed over to the religious authorities. But my kingship is not from this world. Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? After Pilate had said this, he went to the religious authorities again and told them, I find no crime in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. 
Who will you have me release for you, the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it in his, on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no crime in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When, when the chief priest and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no crime in him. The religious authorities answered him, we have a law, and by the law, he ought to die, because he has made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard these words, he was the more afraid. He entered the headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Upon this, Pilate sought to release him, but the religious authorities cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of the preparation of the Passover, it was about the sixth hour. He said to the religious authorities, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. They handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Judeans read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, 
And in Greece, the Jewish priest, chief priest, then said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts, one for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They parted my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did this, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own house. Since it was a day of preparation in order to prevent the bodies from remaining the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the religious authorities asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, 
they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth that you also may believe. For these things that took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled, first, not a bone of him, of his, shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the religious authorities, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave, so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who, uh, who had at first come to him by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds worth. They took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb where no one had ever been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, as the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. For those of you that are readers, I would ask that you extinguish your candles. Perhaps the unscripted words and the unscripted actions of man pale in comparison to the thunderstorm which began as we read through the final days and the final hours of Christ's cross. It is time now for us for our final hymn, For the Bread Which We Have Broken. Page 614, Tammy, if you will turn up the low house lights. Rise if you're able to sing in body or in spirit. Number 614, For the Bread Which We Have Broken.
good, thank you. Now is the time come for us to strip the church, to prepare the church for the time between Holy Friday and the resurrection of Christ when we renew together again on Sunday. I would ask those 15 who had read if they will make their way forward first. And after the 15 have taken their cross, taken their, their points from the, cross, from the church, I would ask also that you simply make lines. Leadership will help you and we'll start passing those lines down until we remove our, uh, all of the elements here within the church that we may prepare for the time of contemplation and Holy Friday.
as the last item clears the doors, you may return to your seat. Stand fast for just a moment. You're invited to return to your seats. Alex, if you would, would you please take the prayer cross, which is in the very back of the church, the one with all the yarn, place that back in the, in the area. I ask you to take the opportunity to view the area behind me, that directly in front of you. That which is called the sanctuary of the church is now stripped bearing none of the familiar items which we rely upon each and every Sunday as we gather together as God's children. It is entirely barren for the next three days where we wait. We'll gather again tomorrow at noon and again at 7 p.m. to commemorate and celebrate the sacrament of Holy Friday or Good Friday as we come together to acknowledge the loss of the life of Christ. I neglected at our time of communion to offer the opportunity for those of you who did not receive the elements of communion, if you wish to receive a blessing in lieu of the communion elements, to come forth now at the conclusion of our service as others are entering quietly, leaving quietly, that you may come forth to receive a blessing. If you do not wish to, I'd ask all of you to join and leave together in silence following this dismissal. Go in peace. May Jesus Christ, who for our souls became obedient unto death, even death upon a cross, keep you and strengthen you this night and forevermore. Amen. Go now in peace and in silence.